So if you have your Bibles, your electronic devices, I'm going to invite you to turn with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Either click to, turn to, uh, however you read scripture um, is, is good with me. Whether it's on a tablet, an iPhone, some type of device, or whether you're old school and you, you still use paper Bible. Uh, if not, then some of the scripture is going to come up on what we call the sky Bible, our screens on the side. And so we're in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. We're only going to have time to look at four verses this morning. I've entitled this message, Walls. I want to talk to you about relationships, and listen, let me just tell you, I, I want to talk to you about, about conflict or how to handle in healthy relationships. See, Paul is dealing with an issue in the church there in Ephesus. He has two groups of people that aren't getting along. The fact is, these two groups of people have built, built walls between them, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. They come from different backgrounds. They come from different areas. Uh, they have some, some different, different beliefs. And as a result of that, they, all of a sudden, they, they developed walls. They developed walls between them to where, to where uh, when they come into church, one group isn't talking to the other group. And so all of a sudden, Paul begins dealing with this issue. And, and so in relationships, right, if we're not careful, we can build a wall. We can build a wall between us and another individual, uh, us and another person. And we have this false belief that we believe that we can build a wall between us and someone else, and it doesn't hurt our relationship with God. And that's just such a false belief. And listen, even companies have to deal with this, right? Uh, companies don't call this walls. Co companies call this silos. And to where you can have one group, that uh, one department that develops a silo, and they don't talk with another department. There's not teamwork. They won't work together. They don't like each other. As a result of that, it hurts them individually. It hurts the company's profits. It, it hurts what they're able to do together. And so tonight, or today, because it is today, right? I still feel like it's Saturday night. Today I want to talk about relationships and I want to talk about these issues because if we build walls in, in our relationships, we're thinking, listen, we think that it will protect us. That's the reason we build walls. But God says it will ultimately hurt, hurt us. Now listen, I, I just want to be clear because I got several questions last night after, after the first service. Um, just really be clear that I'm talking about healthy relationships. I am not talking, this context is not abusive relationships, sexual abuse or physical abuse or, or emotional abuse. That if you're in abusive relationships, then there are some things you have to do to protect you. So I'm talking in the context, I don't want to confuse you. I am talking in the context of healthy relationships. That when we build walls in healthy relationships, that, that it not only disconnects us from others, but it disconnects us from God. And so many times we're, we can be wounded in relationships, right? We can be wounded by a wall that somebody else throws up, we can, we can get hurt, so we, we stack another brick in, in the wall. We can be hurt by a situation, we can be hurt by a circumstance, we can be hurt by what somebody says, and as a result of that, we add another brick in the wall. We can be hurt because someone's different than us, and so as a result of that, we may not understand that, so we stack another brick. We can stack several bricks when we come to the place and we say, you know what, I will never forgive that person. I will never forgive them for what they said. I will never forgive them for what they did. And as a result of that, we stack another brick. And so if we're not careful, we will isolate ourselves <coughs> and we'll go through life and say, you know what? I'll never be hurt like that again. I'll never let someone in. I'll never let someone close to me. And as a result of that, I'm never going to be hurt like that again. And before long, if you and I aren't careful, we start living life in isolation. And we're, we're lonely because here's, here's the crazy thing about walls. I mean, if you're a wall builder, which, by the way, most of us, na it comes naturally to us because of the flesh, the sin. If you're a wall builder, then it, it takes a lot of emotional energy to build walls because you have to build it, then you have to maintain it, and you have to protect it, and you have to make sure nobody gets through. And then you live in this constant tension because God has, listen, God has created us to live in community, not isolation. If you go all the way back to the Genesis count, the creation story, uh, and you know the story, you remember that the first thing that God said wasn't good was what? Loneliness. It is not good for man to be alone. I mean, God, when you look at that story, God created the, the heavens, and then God created the earth, God created the, the animals, and after all that, he says it was good, it was good. God creates the animals, and so, by the way, just my personal opinion, I think cats were the last animals for God to, to create. I think he was tired, and he said, that will do. <laughs> that is good enough for me. And so that's just my personal opinion. If you're a cat person, you probably just stacked a brick. And so, uh, <laughs> and then he creates Adam. 
And he creates Adam, and, and, and he said, and, and he said that, that was what, that was very good. And then the scripture says that God says, listen, Adam didn't say this. God said this. God says it is not good for man to be alone, period. A lot of times we make that like, like a marital stance. We, we make that he's talking about marriage. It had nothing to do with marriage. He says it is not good for man to be alone, period. In other words, man and woman, man is designed to live in community. Man is not designed to live in isolation. As a result of that, he says, I will make a companion, I will make a helper suitable for him. In other words, we have been created to live in community, not isolation. So really, that was more of a relational stance than, than anything else. And so I, I, I know walls come natural to us. I, I remember the first fort that we built as kids. Uh, we would allow some, some in and some not in. And God's word tells us that when we come to the place where we start building walls, it will not only hurt us, it hurts others, and it's a barrier to our relationship with God. Simon Peter was the one that said, that said this as husbands. If your relationship is out of sort with your wife, then your prayers will be hindered. In other words, this, we have this false belief that I can build a wall between me and someone else, and it doesn't hurt my relationship with God. Here's a crummy thing and just a key thought. Here's the crummy thing about walls. Walls I build may protect me from hurt, but they also keep good from coming in. They also keep healthy relationships from coming in. They also keep blessing from coming in. And so a lot of times when we build walls, people interact not with ourselves, but they interact with our walls, the walls that we have built. And every time we try to resolve conflict, it's impossible because when you, when you have walls, you're defensive. You never look at the issue. You deal with the wall, not the issue. And so we build walls that separates us from others and God. So here's what Paul says. That's a, that's a long introduction as we look at this. So second, uh, I don't know why I keep saying 2 Corinthians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Here's what the scripture says. It says, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances that he may create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to, to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So in the time that we have left this morning, I want to, I want to give you four things. I want to give you four things that you need to remember of, of, of tearing down walls in relationships so that there are no barriers between you and someone else. Remember, in a healthy relationship. The first one is this. You have to remember Jesus alone is our peace. Jesus alone is our peace. fact is, in verse 14, the the ESV renders it this way, says, for he himself is our peace. He himself in the Greek is like one Greek word, and it simply means this, alone. In other words, Jesus alone, Jesus plus nothing is our peace. In other words, Jesus is enough. And so if you come to the place that you believe that your, your happiness is dependent upon a person, your happiness is dependent upon a certain uh, situation, that your happiness is dependent whether, whether someone likes you or dislikes you, approves of you or doesn't approve of you, then you're going to live a roller coaster life uh, gaining and, and losing the approval of people because people are going to approve of you one day and the next day they may not. And so people are not our peace. Christ is, is, is our peace. And so what he's saying is this, is that, that we by, by, by our nature, or by our flesh, are people of war. And listen, if, if, you're, if you're at war on the inside, you will be at war on the outside. Someone that's always looking for a battle, someone that's always looking for a fight, someone that's always looking to power up, usually that person, the reason they are is because it's an issue of peace. And if you're, if you're not at peace on the inside, then you're going to be not at peace on the outside. You're going to be a person of war. And if we're people of war, of, of war, then guess what? We're people of walls. In other words, we develop these walls, these barriers. And so people of walls always have people that they don't like, always have people they talk about or criticize or they make fun of or they talk down to. Uh, they always have people that, you know what, they, they talk about their, their, their differences and, and, and people of walls are people that, man, they, they make things so personal. 
And they're always talking to someone, trying to get someone on their side of, of the wall to take their side. The fact is, Paul dealt with this again in, in Romans chapter 14. He had an issue in that church where the, the Jewish Christians weren't getting along with the Gentile Christians. And so they argued over what I call the, the three Ds, um, diet, days, diet, days, and drink. I almost forgot. Diet, days, and drink. Which day should we worship on? Uh, what should we be able to drink and not drink? And then what can we eat and what can we not eat? And so here's what was happening. The Jews were putting pressure on the Gentiles. The Gentiles were, were criticizing the Jews, and they had walls. And so, here, well, here's actually what was happening. The Gentiles were bringing ham sandwiches to the, to the potluck, to the church potluck. They're showing up with ham on their breath, breath and, and bacon on their breath, and it's, ups, it's upsetting the Jewish Christians. So the Jewish Christians are yelling at the Gentile Christians, says, you know what, You're gonna, you, you, you cannot be a good Christian to eat ham sandwiches. And then the Gentiles are screaming back at the Jewish Christians, says, says you know what, you, you don't know what freedom is, and you know what grace is. And so they're having this big battle. And here's what's interesting. Pastor Paul steps into the situation, and Pastor Paul doesn't say who's right or wrong. You know what Pastor Paul says? You're, these are non-essentials to the faith. These are preferences. Your love should like drive you for one another. Fact is, he says in Romans 14, 17, he says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, peace is a, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If, if you want to know, and you hear a lot of people talk about what it means to be spirit-filled, uh, what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit, you know how you know that you're full of the Holy Spirit or an individual is full of the Holy Spirit? When the fruit of the Spirit comes out of your life, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. When those things, love, when those things are coming out of your life, then guess what? You are full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, 1 Corinthians 13 is, is, what, we call the, uh, is what we call the love chapter. And a lot of times in, in, in weddings, a, a preacher will, will read this, and it, it wasn't even in context of a wedding. And that's okay, I understand it. They're trying to describe what love is. But Paul is talking about this issue of love. <coughs> and, and 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love is patient, love is kind, and, and it does not envy and it does not boast. Oh, guess what? Love is not arrogant and it's not proud. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. Love is not rude even when you're angry. It rejoices with the truth. In other words, this like love like bears all things and hopes all things and, and love in, endures all things. And so what Paul was saying, love should drive you to one another. In other words, Colossians 3.15, it says, And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members is so important, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. It's so interesting. And always be thankful. I just tell you, in relationships, whenever we focus on our differences, we're no longer thankful for one another. When we build walls that separate us between us and someone else, a husband, a wife, a brother, a sister, a friend, someone we go to church with, and we start focusing on the, the differences, we start focusing on the ham sandwich and the bacon. We're no longer thankful for them, right? We're no longer thankful for the little things. We're no longer thankful for what they do. You know what we remember? We remember the things they didn't do. We remember the things they, they did wrong. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Love keeps no, no records of wrong. And we start keeping records. When we focus on our differences, it just naturally builds walls or barriers or divisions rather than focusing on on what we have in common. You know, culturally, we're different, right? You guys may have known this. I, in case you're new, I've lost my Texas accent, but uh, so you have no clue. <laughs> but I'm from Texas, and most of you are from Colorado, and I'm still learning your culture. You're still learning mine, right? Uh, we, we, we have some, <coughs> excuse me, we have, we have some differences. Uh, in Texas, we hunt and fish, totally different than you guys here. 
Um, and so here a while back, uh, it's just a funny story here a while back, Karen and I were kayaking on the, on the reservoir. Uh, actually, I, we don't have time for the story, but we almost lost our lives. I mean, it, it like a big storm came up, and we, we, we got to, to a cove and in, a, in, in an area, and I thought, man, this is awesome. We're going to like spend the night here, survival, and so that wasn't awesome to Karen, so some friends rescued us, and so uh, <laughs> she made the call, <laughs> She's like, I'm getting us out of here. And so, but anyway, we're coming off the, out of that cove, and I noticed that, that there's, there's carp in this cove. And, I mean, it looks like flipper turning over. I mean, it's, like, there's carp as big as footballs. And so, uh, so I get my kayak the next day. I show back up in that cove, and I, I, I decide I'm going to catch them the way we do in Texas. And the way we do in Texas, we feed for them. We, uh, so I went to the, I went to the, 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 uh, uh, the feed store, and I, I got some range cubes and sheep and goat pellets and and uh, I dumped, I bu- dumped like 50 pounds of this over the kayak, and and then I, I read scripture for 30 minutes because I'm a preacher. No, I didn't. And so, uh, while well, I waited for the carp to come, and then I had, I had a great, I had great fun. And so I came the next weekend, and I'm telling my buddy Stan, Stan, who's in our church, he's a retired game warden. And so I'm telling him what I did, and, st- and I'm just telling him. I watched the color drop out of Stan's face, and so. He's, and he's like, Pastor Charlie, this is kind of awkward. I don't even know if I should tell you this, but do you know you could be arrested for stuff like that in Colorado? And I'm like, Stan, what? How do you catch fish in Colorado? Dynamite? I mean, what do you do? You've got to have an advantage. And so he says, well, you're, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna have to, like, stop that. And I'm like, well, Stan, I'm so thankful you're retired because you can't arrest me. And so, uh, <laughs> Right? So we have, we have differences. See, this is why Paul says this phrase is just so important. He says, member of one body. We're, we're in Christ. We're members of one body. That's our, that's our commonness. Instead of looking at our differences, how about look at what we have in common? A person of walls are always talking about differences. A person of walls are always talking about disagreements. A person of walls are always trying to get as many people as they can on their side of the wall. See, when you, when you look at this issue of true community, the word, the word community really comes from a compound word that means common unity. The way you have unity in healthy relationships is not focusing on the differences because guess what? The differences is what makes life fun. It would be boring if we were all the same way. It would be boring if we all had the same personality. And so basically it's focusing on what we have in common. Tim Keller says this. He, he says secularism tends to make you feel self-focused. Religion tends to make you tribal. The gospel makes you capable of sacrificing for others. There's a difference. And so the second principle is if we're going to break down walls, it requires us to remember that building walls create division. Building walls creates division. Building walls creates division in, in, in dating relationships, in, in marriage, in, in church relationships, uh, in, in business relationships, but this issue of walls creates division. Uh, Ephesians 2.14 says, Paul goes on, he says, For he, he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. In other words, what Paul begins saying, there's vertical and horizontal, horizontal walls. There's horizontal walls between you and another, and those walls affect your vertical relationship with him. Billy Graham wrote this, I quote, he says, When Christ died, the the veil which separated man from God was ripped vertically from top to bottom, and the way was open for all men to have access to God. This is the vertical aspect of the gospel, but it is not the whole gospel. Paul said he was our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. The horizontal separation of man was broken at the same time as the vertical, Jesus put no color bar on the golden rule that we should treat each other as we want to be treated ourselves. In other words, these two walls, the barrier, are like this dividing wall of hostility. Where, and it's people to people and people to God. In other words, people, people without true peace, people without knowing who they are in Christ and true peace are naturally people of walls, naturally people of hostility. Hostility, listen, hostility not only constructs walls, it, it, gener- it generates even more walls. It generates even more hostility, right? You know this? Like in a family, all it takes is one person to get hostile. 
All it takes is one person to get angry. All it takes is one person to start throwing up walls and talking about people and, and criticizing people. And all of a sudden, guess what? The whole family's mad. I mean, it, it creates that it, it, in, in a corporation, in a business, with your friends. You know what? just takes one. Just takes one person to get mad. Just takes one person to get hostile. Just takes one person to start talking about that group, that person on the other side of the wall, and then all of a sudden it, it affects it, it affects the whole group. I mean, we, we see this with social media, right? I mean, in the mornings when I when I fire up Twitter, I think, huh, wonder what Twitter's mad about today. Because it seems like we're always mad about something. Taylor Swift is mad at the Kardashians, the Kardashians are mad at Kanye, and it's just, it's just like it's just like it's ridiculous, right? And a lot of times we're mad. Listen, I'm telling you, when people gossip and criticize people on the other side of the wall, it can cause you to change your opinion of someone that you've never had a conversation with. This happened to me, and in the, in, in, uh, we planted the church in 95. And, and so in 97, 97, 98, somewhere in there, Horn Creek Christian encampment up in Silver Cliff, uh, West Cliff area, they would, they would allow pastors to go free uh, for three, two nights and three days. They paid all of your meals. They paid your lodging, and it was like a sabbatical. It was a way to bless pastors and also to, to advertise for their encampment. And so, so, But it was a little bit creepy because you ate your meal in the dining hall, and so when you did that as, as, as a pastor family, you had a reserve table, and it would say, Pastor Charlie is on sabbatical. Please do not talk to him. And so that you know, is like, it's like your zoo animals or something, people just walking by and looking. It's just weird. It's just weird. And so in town... We had this pastor, this area pastor of a church, and we had never really met. I mean, we had met, but we'd never really had a conversation. And so he was just, he, he didn't like me. It was obvious there was walls between him and I. And, and so it was obvious that he did not like me whenever we were at a gathering. It was, it was just very clear to me. And so, um, so we'll just call him Joe, okay? That's not his actual name, so don't, you know, don't start trying to put faces with names. And so, uh, so his name was Joe, not a name, but a fake name. And so uh, we checked into Horn Creek, and so the next day, guess who, guess who checks in? Joe. And I'm like, thank you very much, Lord. Like, like, you know, like this is some kind of funny now. I mean, couldn't you have had, like, better timing? We could have just missed this by a few days. But Joe's there, and so we great, and so I make sure I show him the sign, Pastor Charlie, don't talk to Pastor Charlie. And so, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're okay, right? And so, uh, so we go to check out. And so we go out into the parking lot, and so I knew Joe drove a little red minivan, and, and Joe has a flat. It was not me, and so Joe has a flat. And so I said, you know what, I, th I think I need to go in and tell Joe that he has a flat. And so I, I, I tell Karen and the kids, hey, wait in the car, I'm going to go in. So I go in and say, hey, Joe, just want to let you know you got a flat, wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> and he goes, really, can we walk out together? I said, sure. So we walk out together. And then I learned that Joe is not mechanically inclined at all, and he's trying to figure out how much is it going to call trip, cause, cost me to get AAA up here to change this flat. So I said, hey, I'll change your flat for you. He's like, really? I said, sure. So now I got his family, my family out. Uh, I'm under the minivan with the jack, and Joe is absolutely worthless. And so I'm like, just, you know, stay with the girls. And so uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if that was offensive to you. Uh, there went another brick, right? And so I said, uh, so I'm literally under the minivan. And then Joe says this. Joe says, huh, I guess everything I heard about you was not right. People are walls. A lot of times we put up walls about people that we've never had a conversation with. We've never had a conversation about that issue about that gossip we heard about them, about that slander we heard about them, about that story we heard about them. And as a result of that, we built up this idea of who they were. Walls are terrible. Here's the crazy thing about walls. When you're putting up the wall, it's okay. When you're putting up the wall, it's justified. When somebody else throws up a wall, it's sin. It's, not, it's interesting how we look at that. There is nothing, listen, there's nothing natural about healthy relationships. There's nothing nat natural about a healthy marriage. There's nothing natural about a healthy relationships. There's nothing healthy about natural church relationships. It takes, it takes work. And when we focus on our differences, we put up walls. And we focus on what we have in common. And you know what Paul says we have in common? It's a cross. When we focus on what we have in common, that was his message to the Jews and the Gentile Christians there in his church. 
I mean, in other words, we're members of one body. In other words, we belong to one another. When, I, when you hurt, I should hurt. When you cry, I should cry. When you celebrate, I should celebrate. When you have a burden, I should be burdened. The third thing is this. Jesus came to make peace by breaking down walls. Jesus came to make peace by breaking down walls. Uh, verse 15, he says, By abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So he makes two one. He's talking about unity. He's talking about members of one body, so making peace. Now listen, there's, there's a lot of people that you'll see that when walls go up or when there's conflict in relationships, you, maybe you've heard this, someone will say, we just, we just need to build a bridge. We need to build a bridge to that that people group that's different than us. We need to build a bridge to that family. We need to build a bridge to one another. And we need to build a bridge over the wall. But no, Paul talks about the wall being abolished. See, a bridge is used to cross something that can't be crossed. But the issue is still there, right? It's subtle. But in relationships, when someone looks at you and says, you just need to get over it. You know what they're saying? Build a bridge. We're not going to deal with the issue. We're not going to deal with the wall. We're not going to deal with our differences. We're not going to deal with that. You know what you need to do? Buddy, you need to get over it because I'm not really going to talk about the issue. You, just learn, you need to learn how to deal with it. Listen, let me tell you something. That's not a healthy relationship. Healthy relationships is when we acknowledge, we acknowledge that it's there and we, we figure out how to bring it down because if not it's still there in other words what Paul says to where it's totally destroyed it's put to death in other words he came to make peace not by building a bridge but by destroying the wall Ephesians 2 16 says and it reconciles an important word and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby what killing the his stop hostility in other words reconcile in, in the Greek this is the deepest Greek word that Paul could have used for reconcile. It literally means to reconcile is the restoration of a relationship of peace between which has been disturbed. Listen, it only takes one person to forgive. That's Forgiveness is one-sided. Reconciliation, tearing down walls, takes two. It takes people on both sides of the walls being willing to take down the wall brick by brick by brick by having awkward conversations, by, by having conversations face-to-face, -face, by dealing with some of the issues. Because Christ says this, he says, you, you reconcile them both to God through the cross. Our unity is Christ. So many times we forget, whether it's in marriage or whether it's in church or whether it's in dating relationships or whether it's between two Christians, we forget. You know what we have in common? We, we have the cross. You know what we have in common? We have Christ. And we focus, community comes when we focus on that. And the number one tool of breaking down walls is this issue of love. And Jesus said in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, he's talking to the Jews. The Jews loved rules and regulations. They loved checking the boxes. Uh, it wasn't very personal to them. Uh, verse 37, Jesus replied. They asked him what was the greatest commandment. And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So the, the Jewish... People, they're tracking awesome rules, regulations. It's measurable. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says something else, verse 39. And he says, and the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm like, man, we understand loving God is keeping the rules and regulations. But you, need to, you mean, I, mean I, got, I need to love others like myself? Everybody? John 13, 35, Jesus says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How you love one another. Sometimes I don't think we understand the damage that it does when we're out in the community with, with people and we're talking about all of our walls and we're talking about people that we criticize and that are different than us. That says more about us than it does about them says more about us than it does about those on the other side of the wall. And Jesus says, you know how they're going to know your mind? By the way in which you love one another. The last thing, if we're going to tear down walls, we have to remember that Jesus didn't come to take sides but to take over. Jesus didn't come to take sides but to take over. You see this twice in, in Ephesians and Romans. 
that Paul doesn't even take sides over the church conflict. Paul says you need to learn to love one another. You need to learn to forgive. And Jesus didn't come to take, take sides. He came to take over. A lot of times we hear this politically, right? Politicians, especially around uh, uh, elections, they're all talking about God is on our side, God is on our side, God. and both sides say that, or all three sides say that. Or when we get into conflict, guess what? We say our walls are okay, God's on our side, that means God is against them. But guess what? God did not come, Jesus did not come to take sides, he came to take over. Ephesians 2.17 says, and he came and he preached uh, peace to, to, to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And so Jesus didn't come to take sides of the Jews or the Gentiles. He said, you guys have built walls between you, and you need to let love, you need to let peace, you need to focus on your commonness. And anyone who, who will bow down and yield to my authority, he says, I will abolish the walls in your life. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. Humble simply means bow down. At the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Listen, it takes a lot of work to build walls. You, here's what I've learned. You can either bow down and build a wall, or you can bow, bow down to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then allow him at the proper time to lift you up. At the proper time to demolish those, 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 those walls. And so what the scripture tells us is this, is that in healthy relationships, we come to the place in our life to where we, we, we understand this. We understand that walls are dangerous. We understand the things we say about people and how we criticize and judge. It's dangerous. And we understand that it's a false belief to believe that we can have walls between us and another and it not hurt our relationship with God. Because the scripture says, by your love, the way in which you love one another will show the world that you're mine. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?